Well, my dear, I am so glad to see your face at last <laughs> and to be able to say, oh my gosh, thank you so much for doing this with me. I'm so excited to be here. It's so cool to meet you. <laughs> your absolutely beautiful, delicate book, Enchantment, is trying to talk us into something, which I... I believe, I believe <laughs> that there is something that we started missing when our lives got sheared mm. down to these terrible pandemic essentials. Mm. And it's been, why do you think it's been so hard to figure out how to, I guess, move on at all, yeah. convince ourselves that there's something that work that needs to be done now? Yeah, it's a really interesting problem. And I actually think that one of the issues is that we were already in trouble before the pandemic came. Mm. And, you know, we were already in this cycle of fear and suspicion of each other. And this sense had already landed that the world had fundamentally changed and we didn't know what to do with it. And we, yeah. we can't make sense of it and we don't trust it. And so then comes the pandemic yeah. and those rules just get more fixed. And I remember very naively thinking right at the beginning, Oh, well, this will unite us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Whoa. <laughs> but, you know, thinking, wow, that yeah. surely we can all agree on this this thing. Yes. But we can't. Yeah. And there's just been a lot that's happened. Mm -hmm. And we've lived with fear that I don't think most of us have experienced in our, our lifetime. Yeah. With that sense of ever-present fear. And so when you consider all of those factors it's no wonder that we've come out the other side feeling mm -hmm. a little bit broken mm -hmm. i think mm. <laughs> right right <laughs> i guess we were not convinced before that we were experts in uncertainty because yeah. we were just i mean the the apocalyptic feeling mm. erosion of democracy <laughs> of I, yeah i was thinking about this lately i did um medieval history for my a-levels at school when i was like 18 and there was this this phrase that we learned to repeat in exams that was uh, that people became millenarian and eschatological which are words you'll know <laughs> say more about them because it warms my heart that you are <laughs> well they're both concerned really with the coming of the end times aren't they they're both about this mass feeling that the world is going to end yeah. and it was only really recently that I thought oh yeah, yeah. Here, here I am at another millennium and we are millenarian and they're shatological yes. and they're still really difficult words to spell <laughs> How did you know that you were starting to feel the wear and tear of this much mm. perpetual uncertainty? I I really like ground to a halt. And I and it's funny because I when the lockdown came, I thought, well, this is playing into my hands. Like I am used to being on my own in the house all day. Like this is ideal. <laughs> Um, but I wasn't used to having my husband and son around and that was a shock. I mean, God love both of them, but, um, but wow, they talk a lot. I had no idea. And, <laughs> and I, and actually like trying to manage the fears for, a, I mean, he was seven mm. when it rolled around and, and things like whenever an ambulance drove past, he'd say, is that a COVID ambulance? Yeah. And I'd be like, well, I, it might be. We don't know, but it's it's okay. They're taking people to hospital. Like this is this is society running. Like this is actually mm -hmm. functioning, happening, um, and not being able to give him the answers that he needed or mm -hmm. to say the reassuring things, and then trying to keep up with my own work and my own financial fears that that so yeah. many of us had. And yeah. like my mum lives in Spain and her partner became ill. Like we we're very worried about them. We mm -hmm. couldn't get to them if something happened. Mm -hmm. All of those things meant that it wasn't pleasurable time alone as much as I wanted it to be. Yeah. Um, and there just came a point when I realized that time was behaving strangely, like it was skipping mm -hmm. and grinding. And I couldn't access the thoughts in my head. Like I felt like I'd slowed down so much that I couldn't grasp anything that I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And there was this day when I was washing my face in the sink one night and I thought, I washed my face in the sink last night, like last night, moments ago, like mere, like it was like time had kind of gathered up together and we were skipping. Yeah. And yeah, I, I really realized that I just didn't have anything left in the tank. Sometimes when we're stuck in the house or stuck in a routine and the mm. even the routine is good or bad or 
but whatever the normal starts to be, we start to feel like normal should feel mm. ordinary and mm. grounded. And you were like, oh, it's not. This is not It's normal. not that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, like, I realized quite soon on that my son, after about a year, like, my son didn't remember life outside the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And... And I think, I don't know about you, but those new habits became so ingrained in me really quickly. Yeah. They felt really grating at first, but then I've struggled to let go of them. Yeah. You know, I still, still now when it's, when I'm, when it's time for me to leave the house, there's like a, it's like I'm going over a little speed yeah. bump, yeah, you know, yeah. like there's like an extra. You do you add some steps? Uh, am I like, check, check, check? Yeah. Yeah. Like, Ooh, uh, am I allowed to do that? Like, am yeah. I allowed out here? Can I touch this? Yeah. Oh my God, I haven't got a mask on. You know, like all of those thoughts, yeah. they've become, the I've vigilance. internalized them. Yeah, yeah. that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. I've learned those new rules really, really well. You argue that we need, that there's a there's a direction we might be able to head into mm. that in which the world could sparkle a little bit again. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit That's about... That's a lovely way to put it. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that we've been telling ourselves for a long time is that the whole world is very degraded and broken and irreparable and that it's the smart thing to know that you know and if you're in denial of that then you're actually just a bit naive and fluffy and you poor little lamb but you know you're not living in the real world with the rest of us yeah and I I set out to challenge that in this book because that was definitely me you know that was 100% me until re- re- really relatively recently. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, it reflects a lot of the people who are around me and who I grew up with. Mm-hmm. And I've learned that there's a little bit of magic to be found mm-hmm. in all sorts of places. And that to do that is actually a defense, like a way of coping mm-hmm. um, and a way of looking after yourself in really, really tough times. Mm-hmm. And it, to do it doesn't make me any less politically engaged, any less likely to go out and do good in the world. Um, in fact, it makes it more likely because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm getting back what I need. Mm-hmm. And really, I mean, really what I'm talking about is having a spiritual relationship with the world, which is something that makes British people like curl up their fingers and roll into a ball. Uh, Americans are a bit better at dealing with that comment, but but it is. It's about that that sense of having this connected conversation mm-hmm. with something that feels more vast than you are and, and more wise, mm-hmm. um, and trying to enter into a flow with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we need it. If we look for examples in what it would be like if we were more like that, uh, you love looking at kids being wondrous <laughs> yeah. yeah it's uh i mean I, I have learned so much about um the absurd a weakness mm. of childhood by having this now nine-year-old yeah. who every time i look in a pocket it is just uh full of really good things yeah, order or <laughs> <laughs> someone who has been paying acute attention to yeah. Yeah. we have a joke where every time he holds my hand he pretends to be um like pulling his entire body weight away because he just found something in the middle of the road he does it because he knows it makes me feel very sweaty right away but, <laughs> but they his... immediately learn how to push all your buttons don't they yeah. <laughs> that's the first thing that they learn <laughs> Kid 101. <laughs> exactly. Kid 101. <laughs> it's just like little, every little jewel, every little, mm. if there was like the shape of a shadow of a bird on the ground, mm. if there was, uh, I mean, it's, I, I was, uh, <laughs> I have chronic pain and I was, he walked into the bedroom and I was lying on a series of pillows doing a couple weird stretches. And um, he immediately takes this like neck pillow, slings it around his tiny little back like a <laughs> satchel, like a little baby pilgrim's progress. And he's like, where are we headed out to? It was such like a confident jauntiness. And it took him like, and done. Like how fast yeah. they can toggle into this yeah. stretchy. They can drop into play so quickly. Yeah. And we can't, we have to work really hard to get there because yeah. we've unlearned it really well. What are those it's qualities of like play that are not? Because I like mm. when you're like, this isn't just being childish. Like they're yeah. doing a thing. I mean, I I think one of, I mean, I've always worked with kids. So I've spent a lot of time watching kids make art specifically and write. And I, 
we've got play all wrong. Like we've got this very modern idea of play that is either educational and we're governing it and we're setting a series of tasks and we need to know what they're going to get out of that. So, oh, they may be enjoying themselves, but they're actually learning the alphabet. <laughs> I've achieved the day. Yeah. That's nonsense. Um, they'll do that anyway. It's fine. They'll do that for themselves. Um, or we think of play as like something that has to be happy and has to and therefore has to be like noisy and primary colored yeah. and when we see our children engaging with that kind of a world it satisfies us because we think we're giving them something that's specifically childlike uh-huh. and actually that's such a thin representation of play like play can be found in there yeah but it's not very deep and i I think that if you spend time watching children genuinely left to their own devices and not being guided by us and not being praised by us even, because I think we often have to think we have to praise play now, which is just something that happens. It's fine. We can leave it alone. It's all right. <laughs> as with many things in life. Um, <laughs> I don't have to instrumentalize your play yep, into a fine. self-improvement yep. plan. Yep, yep, Are you getting all... into college? <laughs> is it happening now? <laughs> I actually, yeah. sorry, this is a side order, yeah. but... Um, uh, when my son was, you know, two and people are at their peak of scary parenting, um, I saw on somebody else's Instagram a picture of a note that one mother had sent to another after their children had come over to play. And it was like a summary of what the children had played that day. Oh. And I was like, why can't we just leave them alone? They were fine. <laughs> like these kids had had a great time. Like, yeah. A very... But this cultural but, yeah. anthropologist but slash was, mom. Yeah, it was like, wow. So they first of all, they engaged in some imaginative play. And then they did some like spatial play on the slide. And it's like, no, just let them. Know. Anyway, sorry, that's a side side dish. But um, I, you know, I'm, I'm really I'm really conscious of the culture of that. And I think that when you watch kids just play mm-hmm. and leave them alone. And if you remember your own play as well. You realize how multidimensional it is yeah. and how many different emotions it involves and how dark it often is and also how chaotic, you know, and 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 how quiet it can sometimes be and concentrated and obsessive and things that we would now often lead our children away from doing a part of that real necessity that kids feel to sink into deep attention, which oh. is what play really is. It's yeah. just different forms of deep attention. Mm. And when we see adults, I mean, I'm just thinking of all the caricatures of, in the, not that this would happen here, but like in the States, I'm thinking like man with sea do. I'd be like, that's play. A What's man, a sea do? Thank you so much for <laughs> no, you're gonna letting have to take me, me through that jet ski. Is there a jet ski? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, jet ski, uh, jet ski. Also, I've always yeah. played the game, did I use a word or is it Canadian? Is a game I play with myself. And is that I'm, what they call yeah. a jet ski? Uh, I think so. Oh, wow. At least I did in Who lake life. <laughs> It you know, might just can, be your own little you know, word. Is this the sea? Is it just a lake? Where do I live? Yeah. We picture like uh, people and quote like toys, like mm-hmm. big expensive things or mm-hmm. I don't know. Or nightclubs and you know, that's yeah. the adult play we're the invited woo to. Version? Yeah. It's just woo. <laughs> <laughs> or like, I don't know, this kind of sense that adults have to act a bit like children and, and be wacky to yeah. be playing. And, you know, reading is play. Talking to a friend is play. Walking is play. Thinking is play. (laughs) I think we all have different ways of playing. And and it all matters, actually. We really, we need those forms of play. And I think we really need it to be less organized sometimes. Yes. There's my, this is reminding me of my, fa- my favorite book, uh, it's called How Tom Beat Captain Majork and His Hired Sportsman. I don't know. And, <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> illustrated by road, uh, by Quentin Blake oh, as all good things lovely, yeah. must be. Yeah. Um, and it's just this kid, Tom, and he noodles, he noodles around yeah. and yeah. He, there are these, all these made up words, he rakes and mucks and he does oh, all these things that are, uh, but in the end, all of his noodling, which he has been firmly instructed not to do, mm-hmm. and he is punished for noodling. Oh, and so they bring in this, uh, his aunt, Aunt Fidget <laughs> Walkumstrong, uh, wants to, <laughs> and who makes him eat his greasy bloaters, wants, just wants to punish him for all the play. Anyway, the, the noodling, I, that really inspired me. Mm. So I, I have this little stretch of time every, every day if it works out with 
my kid, well, we just call it noodling. Oh, noodling could be really anything, dumb. but I really did learn like, oh my gosh, <laughs> if I hyper, if I hyper structure yeah. this, I will be Aunt Fidget mm. walking strong with her iron hat. It's so easily done. And I, you know, all of we kind of very educated mothers who are used to achieving loads in everyday life, we take that into the nursery with us. Yeah. And we just we're just not needed. Yeah. They're okay. We need to be there to give them a hug when they fall over yeah. and you know, to maybe settle the odd dispute if we can not avoid it. But um yeah. but yeah, it's 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 sad. And I mean in the book I was talking specifically about the play that happens in nature and how yeah varied that is and how that that surface is like a deep terrain like a, this place that you can play infinitely in and it will keep offering you something as you go through life including being an adult 